Hi, um, yeah, thanks for coming along. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Dougal Matthews and I work for uh, Red Hat. Um, primarily I'm working on OpenStack uh, for work. Um, and this is just a, a side project of mine. Uh, I also live in Glasgow where I run the, sort of the local Python group. Um, that's probably about all you need to know about me. Um, yeah, and I hope everyone's feeling okay after the party last night. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking about MKDocs. And so the first thing to get out of the way is how do you actually pronounce the name of this? And it's, um, you can either call it MCDocs, MKDocs, or MCDocs. I tend to go with uh, MKDocs. We should probably decide at some point. So the, you probably can't really read that. It's actually really low quality, but the, the point of it was the, um, the project started on the 10th of January in 2014. And that was when it was split out into its own code base. So originally it was part of the Django REST framework code base. It was uh, just a single file, mkdocs.py. And that actually went back to around September 2012. Um, so the project was started by a guy called Tom Christie, who most people will know for his work on the Django REST framework. And then um, last year when Tom was speaking about it at EuroPython, I was in the audience and I, that's when I started to get interested and involved in the project. I was sitting in the audience and I was kind of messing around on my laptop a bit, as you do, and I looked at the GitHub and I noticed that the Travis build was failing and that kind of got at my sort of OCD sensors and I had felt the need to try and fix the, the failing test. And that kind of, um, yeah, I just got stuck into the project since then. I did consider breaking the build today to see if I could get more contributors, but I couldn't quite bring myself to do it. Um, so thinking about the, the project and the goals, uh, the, the, I, they're quite simple really what we're trying to do I think and the reason for that is I really want the, the project to be something that's easy for everyone to use and really simple to use. Um, so it's really about making writing good documentation easier and focusing on high quality prose based documentation. So I'm not really interested in being able to automatically generate the documentation based on code uh, comments. Um, and one of the things that people mistake about me when they hear I work in this project, they assume that I'm probably good at writing documentation, but actually I'm, I'm probably just as bad a documentation writer as your average person. Um, so this is really, it's almost like the ultimate procrastination of avoiding writing documentation. I'm writing a tool for writing documentation. Um, but I want to make it as easy as, as I can for myself and everyone else, and I'm trying to improve as well as I go. So to sort of explain what I mean by high quality prose documentation, I'm thinking of projects like Django or I think maybe jQuery or Bootstrap, I think of non-Python ones, where they, they treat their documentation in the same way they treat their code. They're really focusing on sort of um, crafting it and looking after it. It's not something that's just generated or an afterthought. It's sort of on par with code, I think. And some of these projects probably have API generated documentation as well, but that's very much kind of a side of the documentation. So you have your main part and then it's like you can go to the API reference if you want afterwards, which can definitely be useful in some cases. Um, and we've sort of grown quite a lot in the last year. It's actually really um, a, a reasonably popular project now. Um, I just sort of plucked four of the larger uh, projects based on popularity. So this is based on things like um, how big their documentation is and how popular they are on GitHub and stuff like that. Um, the first one you'll, is obvious because Tom wrote this project originally. Uh, Gloucester FS is also... Um, <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. Um, Gloucester FS is a distributed networking file system and that's, um, they just have a really large uh, set of documentation, like I think um, in the hundreds of markdown files. So it's just quite nice to see that it works so well for such a large project. Then the Docker Python client um, and finally, Facebook's OS query, which is something to do with, it's like a query language for finding stuff about your operating system, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, we, we get a lot of users coming from Read the Docs. So many of you will know readthedocs.org, but a lot of people don't know as they support, sorry, a lot of people know they support Sphinx projects, but they also support MKDocs projects. So yeah, you, you find a lot of people want to use Read the Docs from different communities, because out of these, I think only, well, sorry, uh, two of them are Python and two aren't. Uh, we, we get a lot of people wanting to use Read the Docs, they don't want to learn Python tools and they don't want to learn restructured text. And that I kind of overlapped with this slide slightly. Um, it's th th what I'm really interested in is making good documentation tools for everyone. Um, it could be for developers or just general technical writers. It's not necessarily about just the Python crowd. I want it to be something that's really open to everyone. And it's just really keeping things simple and easy to use. 
So for example, if you have a Git repository of markdown files and nothing else in there at all, you can actually tell read the docs to build that. They will generate a sort of a stub um, config file on the go and, they, and I'll do a couple of settings that they require for their building, um, but otherwise it will just work and it will just render it fine. Yeah, and it's just you can't really make it much easier than that. So when you actually generate your documentation, this is what it might look like. Um, sorry about the screenshot quality. I also forgot this is when I moved my pointer. Right. Um, so this is the default theme for MK Docs, and this is just it's a bootstrap-based theme, um, but it shows a few couple of interesting things uh, which you won't be able to read, but I can point them out. Um, so obviously this is your main uh, text body in the middle here. Um, and then over on the left, you've got the table of contents along the top, which obviously reflects the current page. The navigation on the top is based on the files that you've got in your documentation. And then we've got a search up here, which uses uh, Luno.js, which is a front end search engine, a JavaScript one. And then just back and forward pages. So we've got quite a lot of features which are just you get for free essentially when using MKDocs. And then you can see the same thing again. This is our read the docs theme. So if you've seen um, MK Docs projects on read the docs, you might, sorry, you might have seen some and not realized because it looks very like the Sphinx theme. There are a couple of tells if you know them well, but they, yeah, it's quite subtle. Um, the, the biggest one is at the very bottom where it says built with MK Docs. And yeah, this is probably our most, um, sorry, most popular theme. The one thing to note is if you are building on read the docs, they do currently don't let you use any other themes than this one at the moment, just because there's some integration contracts we need to sort of establish, and it's a bit tricky for custom themes to do that, but we're working on it. So um, if you want to get started with it, the current prerequisites are that you need um, pip and Python installed, obviously. Um, at some point, I would like to change that, because as I say, I want to reach beyond the Python community, so it'd be nice to have installers for Windows and Mac. Um, I'm aware of people doing packaging for Fedora and Debian. The Fedora one looks like it's coming along quite well. I think the Debian one's already out of date as happens with packaging. Um, but yeah, at, at some point it'd be nice to do sort of some official distributions in that way to, to reach more people because we, we do have a lot of people that are struggling on Windows and so on. And it's also quite painful for me to, for me to support them in setting up manually. Right, and now I'm just gonna try and uh, taunt the demo gods and do a, a demo. Oh, that didn't like so at all. There we go. Right. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got an empty Git repository. The reason for it being a Git repository, oh, it should have been empty. The reason for it being empty, uh, sorry, well, being a Git repository will be apparent in a minute. Um, I'm just gonna make a virtual env. This is where the internet needs to hold up very briefly. Okay, and once more. Okay, thanks, caches. Right, and in this slide, you, you've seen I've done mkdocs new, so I'm just gonna turn this into a, oops. Hmm, that's weird. Okay, mkdocs new, and I don't actually need to do the directory name because I want to do it here, so I'm just gonna do dot and that's added a base config file and just it's created a docs directory with one index in it. Um, now these are very simple files. I've lost sublime text. Okay. Okay, it's just gonna float. And unfortunately I can't see this very easily. So that's the, it just defines the name which is huge, and then there's a one markdown file there, which is also huge. But hopefully you should all be able to read that at least. <laughs> okay, um, and now at this point, as I had in the slide, you can just do mk.serve, and this will just work now locally. There we go. 
Um, okay. Hmm, sorry, I had these windows all laid out before and they didn't move, which is infuriating. Right. I do know how to use the mouse most of the time. Right, well anyway, you can roughly see what I'm doing. The point I want to make here is that the um, mkdocs watches the files and it library loads. We also use WebSockets, so it will refresh the browser automatically as you go. So when I, I just do testing title, and you should see that the commands on the left will just go, and it's a really nice experience when you're editing. It's very tricky apparently like this, but when you've got a reasonably sized monitor having them side by side and you're working, it's a really sort of a slick process. Okay, um, it's also worth noting that I don't like none. Okay, and then when you're adding new files, they will just be automatically picked up by the same automatically reloading and added to the navigation, but because that's too small, it's gone into mobile mode, which is a little silly, but there you go. It's already been added there, and that'll keep happening if you've got like nested directories, it'll create a drop-down menu in the sub and so on. Um, and then you can see sort of search working here, so uh, which is quite nice. It works really well. It's really fast because it's all r done locally. And then the one final thing I want to do, because it's quite nice to see, if I can get back to this, is the experience of uh, changing the theme, because that works really well with the the library load. So this is my uh, config file. I'm just changing it to use the reader docs theme and it reloads and it just changes and it keeps where you are on the page. And it's just quite, it's just, I know it's just quite nice. It's, it feels really satisfying when you're trying out different themes. So we need more themes just so I can do that more. Um, and then finally, to just sort of finish off the, the full example workflow of how easy these things can be. And this is why I cloned a Git, uh, sorry, a Git repository, which is um, on GitHub, but it was empty. So I can just do mkdocs GitHub deploy and it takes a little moment and now this documentation should be live on here. Um, if I can get that link. Oh, okay, I thought that's missing. Okay, you, you can just trust me that it's live. <laughs> I can show any skeptics at the end and we'll go back to the presentation. Okay, um, so that's just kind of showing you the, the sort of the full workflow of how you use it in a very simple setup. Um, and it's just, it's really nice and very easy. There's very little that you have to do. Um, but then when you're going a bit further with documentation and you start to think about how these files would all work together. One of the, um, one of the things that's quite common is linking between different sections. Um, and I, I just got a slide for this because this definitely confuses some users because basically what you should do is you link to a markdown file directly, then during the build process, we update that reference so it goes to the HTML path file instead. Um, and the nice thing about that is when you browse the, the uh, markdown on GitHub, for example, the links will still work because it goes between the different markdown files. Um, and then when you're linking between different sections, you can use anchors, but which are in all the header tags, and that works really well. But it's also it's sort of not ideal just when you want to ever change the title of anything, you can break a link. So we're working on improving the detection and warning about if that happens. Um, you've seen the configuration file very briefly when I was attempting to demo. Um, and I, d I didn't really go into much detail there because I thought I'd just focus on it now. Uh, but it's basically, it's a YAML file. Um, and again, that's about users shouldn't have to edit a Python file to do configuration for their documentation, at least ideally. Um, and the only actual config option that is required is the site name, which is the one you've seen. Everything else, we sort of rely on sensible defaults, but you can change the majority of things like where it loads documentation from, where it builds to, what theme it's using, what pages are included, what pages aren't included. But we, by default, it seems reasonably sensible that you would want to include all of your markdown files, for example. So we just add them all and we add them all to the navigation and we index them all in the search engine and so on. 
Um, I then also showed you the, uh, the deploying, um, and that was just one of the ways you can deploy very easily with MQDocs because the output is just a static website. Um, the GitHub pages works really well. The read docs integration is great, and they add some extra things on top, like they do with Sphinx, to do with different versions. Um, so you, you can have different versions, different builds showing like different branches or tags in your Git repository. And then the Python hosted is also really good. That's the, uh, the hosting with Cheetah Shop. I won't actually go into an example of that, but we have a good example in our documentation. Um, in the, this is a, something that's actually new in Git Master, and we've not quite released it yet, but it will happen soon. Um, so it's to do with, uh, you can now package up themes and upload them to PyPy, so we're starting to get much more distribution there. And I'm hoping that once that, we're also moving a bunch of our own themes out externally so they can be installed rather than just all included, because at the moment I think we've got 17, because we've got a bunch of Bootswatch ones which are like slightly themed, different bootstrap themes. But the maintenance of that is a bit of a pain. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping when this happens we'll then be able to uh, we'll see like an increase in the number of themes available and we'll be able to reuse some of the other ones that people are currently distributing, sorry, including in their source because that's the only way you can really do a custom theme, which is by using the theme directory and um, providing a local path, which isn't ideal. And so beyond that, we're, I'm kind of doing, I've been on a push for a 1.0, but it's, uh, it's kind of fair to say that I've been doing that for around about six months or so. Um, I, I initially started and I was like, I really wanted to push for it to be as quick as possible, but I've stepped back a bit and I'm, I'm just trying to sort of carefully add features and then we'll get there when we get there. At the end of the day, I could call the current version of 1.0, it doesn't make a huge ton of difference. But yeah, the, the goal is to not add a, too many more features at the moment. We really feel like we're feature complete. It's more about polishing things, making things work really well. There are a couple of additions that I'm considering trying to get in for 1.0, which is the much better support for internationalization. internationalization. Um, at the moment, people can use Unicode and write in whatever language they want, but it gets tricky when you want to support multiple languages. Um, and also, uh, building multiple versions is something you can do manually, but I'd like to just help automate that process for people with some same defaults, because it's a, a fairly common pattern. It's something that we struggle with on mkdocs.org itself, that whenever I d we do a release and then I build a new feature, I can't update the documentation with anything else until the new, ver new version is released. Okay, um, and that actually um, sort of brings me, I, I think I powered through that really quickly. Um, that kind of brings me to the, the end where I would have you take uh, sort of questions about uh, the project or if there's anything else you'd like to know about it. And there's some of my contact details if you want to know, uh, if you want to find out more or speak to me later. Um, and I'm also hoping to sprint on Saturday as well if anyone wants to, to join. Otherwise, uh, thank you. Thank you. I have a lot of questions and maybe additional information. Information. Um, do you have a problem that uh, MKDocs plus Thread the Docs broke the links? You know. Do I have any problem? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, in my experience, Thread the Docs plus MKDocs yep. and break the links in HTML. Okay. Um. <laughs> do you have this too? Uh, not that I've noticed, no, and I've, I've not seen, I'm not aware of any open bugs about it, but I'd be happy to take a look after and help you. Okay, and um, uh, MKDocs uses uh, Python model uh, um, only that supports only first version of the uh, markdown. No, no expensive restrictions, you know. Oh, no, we, you can use extensions, they can be defined in the MKDocs config. Oh, okay, thanks, and can you, can you say some, can, can you tell us some, uh, about some uh, tools that convert strings, doc strings into a proper markdown document? Because I use right now edoc and it's very, very ugly. Um, so in terms of um, p pulling in drop doc strings into your documentation? Yeah. 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 Um, so we don't really have any good support for that at the moment. It's something, um, I don't think we really want to have that in mkdocs itself. Um, what we'd really like to do is do something like that more with a plugin API, because it's definitely something that people want, but there's so many different variations, and yeah, if we included something by default, it would probably be a Python one, but we want to try and stay a bit more general. Um, 
so yeah, not really got anything at the moment. I'm aware of some people, um, they've got some tools to get the doc strings out, which then outputs markdown, and then they just build the markdown. And it actually looks pretty good. I've, I've not had any need for it myself. Okay, thanks. And uh, last problem. Uh, <laughs> MKDocs supports only two level of the links. Uh, and not the anymore. Not? No, that, I, that was fixed around a, a couple of months ago. It's definitely oh. in the last two releases. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was annoying. <laughs> Do we have more questions? Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what would be uh, a major reason for using this over and above Sphinx? Okay. Um, for a lot of people, it's simply Markdown, um, or it's um, I think I might be mentioned it just as before you were coming in. Um, well, it's fine. Um, so a lot of people want to use read the docs, for example, but they are not from a Python background. So they don't want to learn Python tooling and they don't want to learn restructured text because typically you only know those if you're a Python developer. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, for me, it's just the real simplicity. It's something that's just, yeah, that, that, that's what really attracts me to it. Probably mentioned that, but I was a bit uh, late here. So uh, does that uh, used to support like uh, codes uh, highlighting, or like if I want to write some? Like, Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Uh, you know, in Markdown you can write code, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but can you somehow signal the type of the language so it can? Yeah. So um, this isn't included. Uh, this is um, it's called fenced code blocks. So you do like um, three backticks. Then you put the name of the language, and then you write your code block, and then three more backticks, and that you can say which uh, language it is. Then um, we uh, we definitely need to improve our code highlighting, though. At the moment, it's kind of deferred to the theme, so that means people are using using JavaScript libraries to do it, and they're not not as good as um, uh, some of the other tools, really. No more questions. Okay, thank you, Dugo. Thanks.